morning, everybody. My name is Kathy Malloy, and I am the director of the Mark Museum and member of OMA Council. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the highly anticipated conference closing keynote, Music Museums in Perilous Times. I would like to begin the last session of the day by acknowledging that Toronto, where the OMA offices are located, has been a site of human activity for over 15,000 years. The land is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat. Today, Toronto is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. We acknowledge, we acknowledge that we walk upon the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples, and we recognize their history, spirituality, culture, and stewardship of the land. We are grateful to all Indigenous groups for their commitment to protect the land and its resources. And we are committed to reconciliation, partnership, and enhanced understanding. Now, it is my great honor to introduce Robert Jaynes. Robert R. Jaynes is an independent scholar practitioner and founder of the Coalition of Museums for Climate Justice. Robert has worked in and around museums for 44 years as a director, consultant, author, editor, archaeologist, board member, teacher, volunteer, and philanthropist devoting his career to championing museums as important social institutions capable of making a difference in the lives of individuals and their communities. You can find Robert's full bio in the speakers section of Attendify and in the OMA website. And now I invite Robert to begin his presentation. Thanks very much for that generous introduction, Kathy. I'm honored to be with you. I also wish to acknowledge that I live and work in Treaty 7 territory, home of the Blackfoot Confederacy, as well as the Stony Nakoda and Sutina Nations and Métis Region 3. I come to you today as a messenger, an impatient and bewildered messenger. Impatient because it's now been 41 years of ignoring the scientific warnings about global warming and its consequences. 41 years since scientists from 50 nations met at the first World Climate Conference in Geneva in 1979. I'm also bewildered by the lack of civil and political resolve to address this crisis. It's incomprehensible to me. How can governments worldwide, res worldwide respond to the COVID-19 pandemic while ignoring the scientific consensus on the catastrophic consequences of global warming? Do we really have to wait until daily life as we know it is no longer possible? For reasons that remain unclear, the Canadian museum community has yet to have a forthright conversation about the climate crisis, including the role and responsibility of museums. In addition to their deep view of time, museums are eminently qualified to address the climate crisis. They're grounded in their communities and are expressions of locality. They are a bridge between science and culture. They bear witness by assembling evidence and knowledge and making things known. They are seed banks of sustainable living practices that have guided our species for millennia. They're skilled at making learning accessible, engaging, and fun. And last, they are some of the most free and creative work environments in the world. Despite their unique capacities, it's unclear what will provoke the heightened consciousness needed to make climate action a priority in the museum community. My purpose today is to focus your attention on the gravity of the climate crisis, as well as to examine some obstacles that hinder museums as forces for good. I'll also suggest ways that members of the museum community can activate their personal and organizational agency to mobilize museums as a force for good. Unfortunately, the influence and capacity of museums to confront the climate crisis remain largely dormant, awaiting some undefined moment in the future when understanding will align with action. Regrettably, we're rapidly running out of time for this convergence. People who are concerned about the climate crisis are asked to provide hope, but hope is far less important than the courage and decisiveness required to make the difficult choices and sacrifices that are needed right now. The world we once knew is never coming back and there's no hope that these changes can be reversed. You might be wondering why I'm so concerned about climate change. As a graduate student doing archeological research in Canada's remote subarctic, I spent six months living with a band of Dene hunters. 
Their culture is thousands of years old and is based on intimate knowledge of one of the most severe environments in the world. It was there that I learned firsthand the meaning of social ecology, that social and environmental issues are inseparable and both must be considered simultaneously. This inescapable truth that our lives are inextricably linked with the natural world inspires my belief that the global museum community must take a concerted stand on the climate crisis. There are well over 55,000 museums in the world, the largest self-organized franchise in the world. This massive resource can now be mobilized as a global movement to confront the climate crisis. Despite this potential for meaningful action, no museum or museum association has yet risen to the challenge of leading a national international initiative to confront the climate crisis. What does the climate crisis mean for us as individuals and museum workers? The UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has warned us that we have just 10 years left to limit the catastrophic impacts of climate change. We have already warmed the planet one degree Celsius. If we fail to limit that warming to 1.5 degrees, even a half a degree more than that will significantly worsen extreme heat, flooding, widespread drought, and sea level rise. To limit our world to 1.5 degrees warming, carbon pollution will have to be cut by 45% by 2030 and come down to zero by 2050. Canada gets a failing grade on mitigating the effects of climate change. It's among the top 10 emitters of greenhouse gas emissions in the world, with per capita emissions upward of four times higher than the global average. Canada is warming roughly twice as fast as the global average, and in northern Canada, it's even worse, with temperatures rising three times as quickly. Leaving no room for doubt or confusion, the author Richard Powers writes, life will cook, the seas will rise, the planet's lungs will be ripped out, and the law will let this happen because harm was never imminent enough. Imminent at the speed of people is too late. Or to quote an article in the recent New York Times, we know that if we don't act to reduce emissions, we risk the collapse of our civilization. We also know that without a gargantuan intervention, whatever happens will be worse for our children, worse yet for their children, and even worse still for their children's children, whose lives our actions have demonstrated mean nothing to us, end quote. Ignoring the science may allow us to find some comfort in illusory hope, abetted by that magical belief that someone else is going to fix this, but it's far too late for this kind of thinking. What follows is a quick primer on the disaster we're now living and ignoring. First, tipping points are converging. The term climate tipping point was coined to describe how, under pressure from global warming, parts of the climate system could suddenly collapse or run out of control. Climate change researchers now conclude that of the 15 potential points identified in 2008, nine now show signs of being active. They conclude that the evidence from tipping points alone suggests that we are in a state of planetary emergency. Second, societal collapse has begun. I realize that these are unthinkable words for many, much like talking about the climate crisis was until recently. Nonetheless, Jem Bendel, a professor of sustainability at the University of Cumbria, writes that societal collapse due to climate change is already here. He launched the Deep Adaptation Forum for people who want to explore the personal and collective changes that might help us to prepare for and live with a climate-induced collapse of our societies. Current signs of societal collapse include untenable economic inequality, the spread of authoritarian governments, the collapse of biodiversity, an economic system dependent on growth, consumption, and debt, and the failure of governments and institutions to respond to, let alone anticipate, these crises. For us as individuals, families, and communities, collapse refers to the ending of our current means of sustenance, shelter, security, pleasure, identity, and meaning. Third, 
The concept of sustainability is a myth. Most approaches to environmental sustainability have centered on green growth, which is described as a win-win proposition, continuing economic growth while simultaneously meeting environmental goals. The promise of green growth denies the fundamental relationship between economic growth and greenhouse gas emissions, however, and fails to see that continuous economic growth is the root cause of the climate crisis. In short, ever-increasing economic growth and accumulation drive consumption and the associated harm to the environment. Climate advocates are finally saying that only a complete overhaul of our capitalist economic system from energy to transportation to agriculture will get us out of this crisis. Now, alarm is a good thing, but not quite panic, as panic typically shuts down thinking, while alarm can generate courage and resolve. Confronting the climate crisis has recently been likened to the Second World War, and it's instructive to consider what was happening in England in 1944. Rick Atkinson, a military historian, writes, Privation lay on the land like an odor. British men could buy a new shirt every 20 months. The monthly cheese allowance stood at two ounces per citizen. Many children had never seen a lemon, and vitamin C came from turnip water. The Ministry of Food promoted austerity bread with sawdust, and victory coffee was brewed with acorns. It's been suggested that we now adopt an emergency wartime mindset and be prepared to do what it takes to confront the climate crisis. So the odor of privation haunted England in 1944, and now there's an odor of a different kind, that of lunacy. For example, negotiators at the, 19, at the 2019 United Nations 25th Conference on Climate Change failed again to agree to a deal that would limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Scores of civil society groups condemned the European Union, Australia, Canada, and the United States for their myopia and cowardice. There have been 33 climate conferences in the past 50 years, and none of them have reduced the rising CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. Instead, the world's governments now plan to produce 120% more coal, oil, and gas by 2030 than is allowable in order to meet the Paris climate target of 1.5 degrees of warming. In the final analysis, the climate crisis is about death, the death of some or all of the biosphere, perhaps hundreds of millions of people, and perhaps our way of life. As the extinction of the more than human world is already well underway, it's imperative to move beyond thinking about the climate crisis and start feeling it. Individuals and organizations must now confront climate grief head on, which requires that an intellectual understanding of the climate threat must also be internalized on an emotional level. The climate crisis must become a constant companion, however unwanted. Joanna Macy, the environmental activist and Buddhist scholar notes that the depth of your grief is the measure of your love. One way to nurture and cope with this emotional awakening is to recognize that all of us are part of a family. If the next generation matters to us, then what about those children and their children's children? So write a letter to your grandchildren, your children, your siblings, your partner, or yourself, and tell them what you were doing in the early 21st century when the earth was unraveling from the climate crisis. Just as you are able to reflect on your personhood and take action, so can museums. The potential of all museums to tell these stories and connect with individuals and families on a deeply emotional level is limitless. Then consider your thoughts and feelings for the more than human world. One would certainly treat a plant differently if that plant were seen to be a nuisance or an economic object or a relative. By nurturing a unified perception of the natural world based on the awareness that we're all related as indigenous peoples have known forever, it will be easier to accept that we can no longer have whatever we want, whenever we want it. Understanding that the earth is a single system 
and that human behavior is imperiling this system on a global scale is essential to comprehending the true meaning of the climate crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic is an indication of things to come, which I will discuss shortly. We know what needs to be done. We must drastically reduce our carbon emissions, level inequalities, reverse environmental degradation, diversify economies, and reduce the world's population. Humankind can no longer afford capitalism with its commercialization and commodification of everything. We need new values, a heightened consciousness of the more than human world, and change how we live and work. I've got some suggestions for getting started. First, tell the truth. The most important thing is to talk about the climate crisis in frank and open ways. And there are two lessons we can learn from the LGBTQ community. The first is the need to have conversations about uncomfortable subjects like queer rights and the climate crisis. And the second is the need to recognize the immorality of inaction. Climate change has many dimensions, scientific, political, social, etc. But above all, it's an ethical issue because we know that human actions are at fault because of what we value, comfort, convenience, and consumption. Second, to get comfortable with discomfort. Recall the earlier discussion about privation and sacrifice in the UK. It's now time to ponder, even to prepare for a completely different way of life. A French consultancy has identified measures needed to limit carbon emissions to 1.5 degrees of warming. And they include no new public or commercial construction, including no new museums, one kilogram of new clothes per person per year, and no unjustified flights outside of Europe from 2020 onwards. Third, move from me to we. The climate crisis cannot be confronted through individual action alone. We must broaden our awareness to embrace community mindfulness and recognize our shared vulnerabilities and our mutual interdependence. If such collective action strikes you as unrealistic, then consider more modest forms of collaboration, such as the 26 German art museum directors who called on their government to create a central task force dedicated to climate change policy in museums. Working together is a critical first step in moving away from the comfortable insularity of museums, and all museums can do this. Last, resist. Harvard University professor Erica Chenoweth writes that nonviolent resistance is the quickest and safest way to fight injustice. Her research found that no government can survive if just 3.5% of its population mobilizes against it. That sounds like a small number, but in absolute terms, it's an impressive number of people. In Canada, it would mean 1.3 million people engaged in mass non-cooperation with governments that are indifferent to the climate crisis. In the absence of political courage to act, resistance is essential. The British-based group Extinction Rebellion is a model for this kind of work. I mentioned earlier the possibility of social collapse, ominous words indeed. I'm not an alarmist, but I accept the precautionary principle and believe it's essential to imagine what could happen. Along with the climate crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic continues and there's no certainty about what this portends for our biological, cultural, and economic futures. We may well be in a time of extraordinary danger. It's essential, however, to reflect on the COVID-19 pandemic as a preview and dress rehearsal for the climate crisis and to ponder that the earth is telling us that we must rethink our growth society. We must flatten the greenhouse gas emission curve and recognize that business as usual will not do it. Business as usual is already a disaster. The pandemic is an unprecedented opportunity to reconsider and change both our personal and professional lives as we explore two fundamental questions. What meaning do we want to give to our lives at this time and how should we live? This is the existential crisis of climate change that permeates even the popular press and is perhaps the greatest spiritual challenge of our time. Happily, the pandemic is clearing away some significant cultural distractions, 
that have misled or prevented us from addressing these questions. And some of these distractions include extravagant and wasteful ocean cruises, unnecessary shopping and consumption, trivial jet travel, and the assumption that I can do whatever I want whenever I want to. As the pandemic reveals the emptiness of consumer culture, numerous encouraging developments are also emerging, such as governments acting decisively and effectively when forced to do so. Second, individuals, families, and communities drawing on deep reservoirs of creativity, resourcefulness, and courage to adapt and adjust. Third, a new level of organizational consciousness in the public and private sectors, including the viability of working from home and the elimination of meetings and conferences that require air travel. Last, citizens are reverting to skills and knowledge that were once the backbone of our civilization, such as slow cooking, sewing, gardening, canning, preserving, home repair, and do-it-yourself. We have now collectively experienced little or no air travel, empty streets, closed shopping malls, working at home, limited entertainment options, and video conferencing as a mainstay of communication. We must ponder what these abrupt changes and losses in our privileged lives mean, likely far less than we're accustomed to believing. Perhaps we can change how we live and discard the values and assumptions underlying our consumptive way of life. Surprisingly, North American society is being empowered by the erosion of materialism noted above and the collective resilience brought about by the pandemic. Individuals and organizations are questioning what a return to normal means and whether normal requires complete rethinking. Why, we must now ask, are museums reluctant to awaken from their slumber to serve as a global force for good and explicitly address the climate crisis? Well, there are complex reasons for this reluctance and many are self-imposed. These obstacles arise in large measure from mediocre governments, governance coupled with weak leadership. Far too many small museums, for example, operate as private clubs that are governed by well-intentioned citizens whose passion is the museum, but whose aims are often narrow and self-serving. The casualties of this dysfunction are overworked and underpaid staff many with advanced degrees who have no say in their museum's vision, mission, values, and priorities, assuming that these are even formulated. At the other end of the continuum are the medium to large museums, financially stable and either government owned or corporate nonprofits. Here the dark cloud of hierarchy is pervasive in tandem with elite exclusionary governing authorities and brittle organizational design. In larger museums, it's customary for the executive staff to have far too much authority and responsibility that is seldom if ever shared with staff, much less challenged. Communication is top down. Staff know little or nothing about such essentials as their operating budgets. And there's fearful adherence to following orders, not asking questions and communicating through proper channels. Such behavior has been identified as functional stupidity and I'll return to this shortly. Having spent close to 45 years in and around museums, I cannot recall the number of times staff have approached me about their lack of control over their work, the indecisiveness or insensitivity of their supervisors, the consequences of undefined expectations, inadequate communication, the lack of information, the list goes on. Although many museum leaders claim to steward their organizational vision and mission, they are far too often remiss in not sharing it with anyone but senior colleagues or not at all. These dysfunctional characteristics are widespread in the museum world and in most cases are coupled with the debilitating claim of institutional neutrality. The notion that taking a stand on a moral or civic issue will alienate funders and supporters. The consequences of flawed governance, weak leadership, and the claim of neutrality create disempowered staff in museums, just at a time when their ability and willingness to take action in the world is critical. The ability of museums to assist in ameliorating the effects of the climate crisis is far too great to allow outdated museum cultures to impede the energy, commitment, and intelligence of motivated staff. 
The pandemic has been described as the reset button we desperately need to clear our collective memory and start over. Transformation can begin in many ways, all requiring courage, risk, and commitment. I have some suggestions for strengthening and using your personal agency in your museum. First, governance. Ask to attend a board meeting or arrange a reception with the board of directors and the staff. Meet the board members, ask them about their lives and experiences and make sure they know what staff do at your museum. In addition, ensure that all board members are given a thorough tour and briefing on all aspects of the museum's work. Second, leadership and management. Meet with your CEO or your executive director once a, a year and review your accomplishments, analyze challenges, and discuss how things might be improved. In addition, meet with your supervisor at least quarterly for review and reflection. Every competent museum should have clearly articulated strategic goals that are widely communicated and staff must insist upon involvement in strategic and operational planning. Third, the work environment. All museums should also avoid rules, practices, and policies that are designed to protect the organization from making mistakes. These rules are designed with the least competent individuals in mind and force all staff to perform at the lowest level of competence. Irrespective of what we know about effective management, functional stupidity occurs in far too many museums, as mentioned earlier. Researchers coined this term to describe organizations that hire intelligent and capable people, but create cultures and decision-making processes that inhibit them from raising concerns or making suggestions. Functional stupidity in the workplace is best described as when smart people are discouraged to think and reflect at work. Instead, staff are encouraged to emphasize positive interpretations of events, leading to self-reinforcing stupidity. Talented and committed staff are acutely aware of this dysfunction and feel powerless to ask, act. Fourth, finances. Insist on seeing a transparent annual budget, which should be the subject of an all staff meeting with questions and discussion. Business literacy, including how to understand the budget is essential. It's also necessary to know how much money is allocated to your work unit or activity. Last, personal. Share aspects of your non-work life. Your seemingly unrelated skills, knowledge, and experiences are important as your museum broadens its awareness and engages in the issues and aspirations of its community. Beyond that, your personal values, interests, and commitments are the foundation of personal agency. Cultivating and sharing your skills and knowledge are vital to individual growth and continuous learning which in turn strengthens the museum as an organization. Much of what I've discussed here is about values, those enduring beliefs that describe how we want to treat others and how we want to be treated. The greater the congruence between individual and organizational values, the stronger the organization. Museums have evolved through time from the elite collections of imperial dominance to educational institutions for the public, and now to the museum as mall. The mall is the culmination of marketplace dominance, largely devoted to consumption and entertainment. There is an important lesson in this historical trajectory, and it is the ability of museum workers to learn and adapt as circumstances require. The next iteration of museums is pending, and in, in these challenging times, I submit that museums must become institutions of the commons, belonging to and affecting the whole community as a key civic resource, responsive to citizens' interests and concerns, and grounded in enhancing societal well being. I'm hoping that you're beginning to think about what you can do now in your museum. So, here are some practical suggestions that require little or no new funding, just courage and commitment. First, revisit your vision and mission. Ask yourself, your colleagues, and your bosses some big questions, such as why does your museum exist? What changes are you trying to affect? What solutions will you generate? And what are your non-negotiable values? This questioning will move the museum beyond the what and the how and into the realm of values, meaning, intent, and relevance. Second, Develop an advocacy policy which delineates what issues are important and how your museum will respond when confronted 
with moral and civic challenges such as the climate crisis. Then measure the carbon footprint of your museum, including its energy consumption. There are plenty of tools available. Then reduce your consumption in all areas of your operation. Having done these things, publicly declare a climate crisis and your intention to do something about it. Last, tell your visitors how the climate crisis came to be and let them know that this is a key issue for your museum. Start the conversation with your supporters, listen, respond, reflect, and then move out into your community. In short, start truly thinking outside the box we're now in. If you do so and commit to some or all of these initiatives, I have no doubt that you and your museum will begin to change in ways that will motivate and fulfill you. One thing is certain, continuing to live and work in our accustomed way is not just failing, it's suicidal. Nonetheless, all is not gloom and doom. There is no question that we are living through the intensification of the global climate crisis. And the underlying premise of my closing keynote today is that if each of us has something valuable to offer, there is no correct approach. We can come together and share our confusion, our uncertainty, and our sense of what we can do. Can and will museums operate with this deeper sense of purpose? To do so, we must first acknowledge the enormity of the catastrophe we have created and assume responsibility for our actions. The scholar and the theologian Stephen Jenkinson wrote that if you pay full attention to our ecological state, quote, it mitigates against your happiness, contentment, and your sense of well being. Having a conscience now is a grief soaked proposition. If you awaken in our time, you awaken with a sob. End quote. We must think and feel this awareness deep into our consciousness, despite the anguish. In concluding, and in the words of the eminent historian Arnold Toynbee, great civilizations are not murdered. Instead, they take their own lives. He arrived at this conclusion in a study of the rise and fall of 28 civilizations. The arc of history, however, is replete with lessons and warnings to avoid unnecessary suffering and even societal collapse, but only if we are willing to listen to the past. Museums are the voices of the past as well as the present. We now have an unprecedented opportunity as museum practitioners, academics, and students to catalyze museums as key civic and intellectual resources to take action in this deepening crisis. I'm hopeful that each of you will increase your awareness of the climate crisis, embolden your thoughts, and help lead the way. What happens next is up to us. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, there was a lot to digest. And um, for museums right now, um, I, I'm in a medium-sized museum. And I think a, a lot of uh, museums are wondering what's going to happen. As we recover from COVID, um, a lot of us are looking at at least another year down. And some are looking at completely disappearing off the face of the map. And I, I agree with you that this is our time to become much more relevant to our communities, especially those like Mark Museum, which is a community museum and only survives by working with our community. And it's amazing what COVID has done. It's brought out voices that have never uh, felt empowered to speak quite so loudly. So this is another one of those things that we have to, um, that we need to incorporate into our planning as we rebuild. Um, so I get, I guess one of my questions is, what about those communities, those tiny, tiny communities that aren't going to survive and the museums aren't going to survive? Um, do you have any any um, advice as to how how they could? Well, I, I guess first of all, Kathy, are there data? Is there research on museums that aren't going to survive? I mean, why aren't they going to survive? Is, what's the basis of this of this uh, funding? Funding will be cut because a lot of um, organ a lot of especially if you're funded by government. Um, and I don't have maybe Mary. Uh, um, the OMA has the stats on that, but 
uh, anecdotally, I'm hearing about places that are going to have their funding cut and they will no longer be in their communities. So, um, and those are the ones that I think um, are fighting the most. I, and maybe there isn't an answer to that, but I'm just wondering if you had any advice around that. Well, I, I guess I would think that if, if, the, um, if the museum is truly part of the community and it, it, it adds value and substance to the life of that community, then it would seem to be in a strong position to resist the complete lack of funding and thus closure. I mean, if the museum is connected with individuals and organizations in their community and families, then presumably they have some sort of basis to argue for their existence. Uh, I'm not sure why they would just be thrown away simply because there's not enough money. I would hope that they have enough credibility in the community that they could at least open a discussion about their, uh, their, their, their sustainability, their longer term existence. Um, but I, I guess in some ways that goes back to some of the, um, I guess rather negative comments I made about a lot of small museums are private clubs and because they're private clubs, they don't have that reach into the community. So I guess then when our civic leaders make decisions, they don't see that museum as private club as being that important to the community. So it's easy yeah. to cut the money. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I do have a question. Um, the ROM has a climate change curator. What does someone in a role like that have to do to be successful? Well, I think they have to go back to some of those uh, those basic things I said a bit earlier, and that is I, the first thing they have to get together with the board and the staff and, and, the, and the leaders and have a look at the vision and, and mission of the organization so that the climate crisis becomes a strategic objective that's front and center in the minds of the, of the leadership and the governance. The charity starts at home and they would be in a, in, a, in a vulnerable position, I think, if they went out preaching the gospel of the climate crisis without starting to look after their own house. And that begins, I mean, it's just basic. We have to cut our carbon 45% within 10 years. And museums in North America and Europe are some of the biggest energy hogs in the world. And museums must start looking at their level of consumption and cut that back. So I would think that uh, that climate change um, curator has to alter the vision and mission of ROM to incorporate the climate crisis as a fundamental priority as say the uh, Australian National Museum has done, Museums Australia. They have to make a commitment, make an announcement of that climate crisis and then get on with the work. But they have to start internally mobilizing the resources and the wealth of ROM to get behind that crisis. Okay. So do you see, um a greater role in the, the provincial museums, um, uh, perhaps leading the charge? I do indeed. I mean, I think that the, the large museums, the provincial museums, the more independent ones like Rom, have a key role to play in exercising leadership in this crisis. And as far as I can tell, uh, there's pretty much a vacuum when it comes to those large institutions. And I base that on uh, the work I've been doing with the Coalition of Museums for Climate Justice. It started out with about 60 invitations and now it's risen to about 1200 and so participants um, in the coalition and very few of them are senior museum directors. I'm not sure what's going on there, but it would appear the light bulb has still not gone on with respect to uh, the involvement of senior museums in Canada in this crisis. I have a, another question. Which of our museum practices can we adjust first to reduce our consumption? And I think you just maybe perhaps answered that about the carbon. Well, I think, I think, I mean, that is a good question because there's so many aspects. I mean, you just look at say loans and traveling exhibitions, to, especially they're huge users of, of power and energy, but I think buildings are the number one mm -hmm. because so many museum buildings are, are older and not up to sort of 21st century standards. And I think the physical plan is where to start first in terms of okay. reducing consumption. And of course that leads into collection areas too. Yeah. But it's interesting to know, you know, that even the Canadian Conservation Institute is relaxing its standards with respect to environmental controls for permanent collections because they realize now that the vast majority of the objects don't really need 40% relative humidity, for example. 
So there is an awakening going on. And I think, as I said in my talk, measuring your carbon footprint, there are a lot of tools out there. And interestingly, um, a really important initiative has begun in Canada with respect to measuring the carbon footprint of the cultural industries, but it didn't get with, begin with museums. It has started with the Quebec Drama Federation and they started worrying about the energy consumption in performing arts venues. And they've now extended that interest to the museum community. And they've reached out to our coalition for assistance in awakening the museum community about this. And you'll hear more about that in the near future. Um, I do have another question. Can you think of institutions that are leading in the way, in this way, uh, uh, addressing climate change? And what are some of their initiatives that you like that are worth imitating? Well, one, for example, would be the uh, Anchorage Museum in Anchorage, Alaska, run by a woman by the name of Julie Decker. And she started, um, I mean, they're, they're very sensitive to the carbon footprint of their physical plant, but she started a sort of community discussion forum where she she brings in, I mean, her, her publics, her supporters, and they're having a whole a series of key conversations, almost sort of like a laboratory or workshop where they talk about what the climate crisis means and what they can do as individuals, families, and communities to address it while the museum is providing these sort of resources. So in other words, she has started the conversation with the community because admittedly, I mean, we as family members, parents, whomever, um, we don't necessarily know what to do. There's a lot of information out there and museums can serve as clearing houses to get that information, that scientific information out there in intelligible ways so that people can actually use it in their daily lives. I mean, it's this notion that there are 55,000 to 80,000 museums in the world. And like I said, they're the largest self-organized franchise in the world, but they're public storefronts. There are no other organizations like that. Governments don't have the ability to engage people face to face. Corporations don't care to do it. Museums are ideally positioned to declare the climate crisis, meet with their people, meet with their communities and start this awareness building and this action. I have another question here. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about some ways in which museums could measure their impact related to the change that they are making in relation to the climate change. For example, how could they know the impact through education and interpretation initiatives in their visitors and communities. You have perhaps you have some examples around how people have measured that. Well, I, I think the, the first thing again is this pragmatic thing. We've got to get down our carbon emissions. And, and, and that starts within the museum with museum staff, how they do their work. Um, in, in terms of um, I'm not sure exactly I understand the question, but in terms of me evaluating impact? Yeah, how do you evaluate, measure the impact you're making in a community? Well, I, I mean, that, that's, I guess that depends on what you're doing. I mean, we know how many sophisticated evaluation tools there are for um, people who engage in educational programs, all the work of John Falk, for example. But I'm thinking just in terms of the hardcore of the climate crisis right now, First of all, you have to have an idea. You have to be able to measure your impact before you can do anything about it. And that's why I keep harping about this notion of reducing our carbon. Um, and, and those systems are out there. There's a way to measure it and there's a way to mitigate it. And I think that once the museum can do that and is engaged in that responsibility, they can begin to share that experience with their communities, with individuals and families who can adopt similar sort of approaches and methods in their own lives, in their personal yeah. lives. Okay. Um, the, so I see uh, there's a question in the chat. It didn't come through the Q&A. It's got, uh, you make a case for changing our current economic model of consumptive capitalism, but what do you propose to replace it with? Is socialism? That's another question. Well, I, I, I mean, that, that's a good question because, I mean, capitalism had a lot of real advantages too, but I think it's, got, it's gotten away on us. And I'm thinking that um, even before that notion of replacing capitalism, we just have to start thinking about our personal responsibility as consumers. Because if we have to cut our carbon by 45% uh, in 10 years, we just simply have to stop a lot of the habits we've engaged in for so long. 
And those are capitalistic habits. They're all based on economic growth. They're based on borrowing money to buy stuff. Uh, and I think that that's the first sort of line of defense is to reduce our individual consumption. Um, in terms of capitalism, I, mean, I don't really know, but you see increasingly now in smaller communities um, that capitalism, capitalism is being replaced by you know, more local food independence, bartering, um, sharing skills, uh, borrowing tools. I mean, that sort of thing. Now, that sounds pretty absurd when you compare it to a large urban area uh, like Toronto, but I would say that uh, let's not worry about replacing capitalism right now. Let's just worry about reducing our own portion of the capitalistic effort by reducing what we consume. Do you have anything else to add, Robert, that we didn't? Oh, um, I would say, you know, if you're interested, go to the Coalition of Museums for Climate Justice website, have a look, and uh, it's really not a membership organization. You can just kind of sign on and take advantage of the conversation and the resources that are available. Um, you can also start looking around the world, too, and I see, Kathy, that you are, or Mary, you've kindly put in some, some good resources there. Um, unfortunately, North America, Canada, the United States are way behind this level of climate crisis consciousness that you will see, for example, in Europe. There are dozens of organizations there that are uh, fully engaged in trying to address what this means for museums and their communities. And that's a good, good sample of the links, but they're about probably four times more than that. Okay, I have a couple more that have come in. Um, what elements of the climate crisis, protest signs, government flyers should we save and archive to document the current moment movement? Well, I think I think you would um, you would collect those things in the same way that you collect in other subject areas. Um, I think that current collecting is really important. And then there's another related question: How can we reinter reinterpret our collections and community stories? with a climate change lens? Um, and that's actually a very good question because um, at the current time, a lot of museums are, are examining their collections and reorganizing them and going through massive dig session projects. So how can we reinterpret that within our collection policies? Well, I, 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 that's a really good question. And I, there's a lot of really interesting possibility there. I mean, I, I would go back and look at questions with this notion of privation in mind. Uh, that description I gave of, of the UK in 1944, because, I mean, like I said, I, I'm not an alarmist, but I'm, uh, I guess I'm fairly conservative in the sense that I think, you know, before too long, we're going to begin to suffer more and more privation and more and more deprivation as a result of what's going on, not only with COVID, but with the climate crisis. And so, as I mentioned, museums are seed banks. They're seed banks of our cultural adaptations that have served us for millennia before fossil fuels, during, and what about after? So I think you can go back into collection and say, well, what are these examples of human adaptation that maybe preceded fossil fuel use or preceded our extraordinarily heavy use of fossil fuel use that may be relevant now? You know, wind generation is one thing. I mean, for the longest time, in um, Canadian uh, agrarian communities, they generated their own power through wind, their own wind turbines. Can we learn anything there? I mean, there are all sorts of examples about how we lived and adapted before the fluorescence of fossil fuel use. And museums contain that knowledge, they contain that experience. But I think if one goes back with an open mind, there may be all sorts of valuable and relevant surprises. Yeah, I guess, one of the questions I guess I, I would, ask um, too is around some of the efforts we've made within museums to reduce our, our, our carbon footprint. At the museum here we have a Lee Gold collection exhibition hall but the expense of um, and now it's 11 years old so maybe the systems that are being in, in uh, put in place now are, are more efficient than what we have but it's an inc incredibly cumbersome groundwater heat pump system and an expensive system to maintain. So I'm wondering if you know of any other um, systems that could help people when they're looking at larger construct construction projects or any um, ways that you would direct them to assist with building buildings that are, are reduce our carbon footprint. 
You mean the, the, w with the introduction to have green technology like photovoltaic cells, solar mm -hmm. panels, wind turbines, yeah. Yeah. thermal generation, that sort of thing? Yes, yeah. Well, there, there, there are so many resources out there. I mean, I, I'm not an engineer or a technical expert, but um, those systems are all in place and they're probably best enca encapsulated in the lead uh, you know, building hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Uh, for those buildings, architects and builders who are environmentally conscious, there's several standards that relate to your um, to your consumption of energy. I mean, there's interesting stuff going on. The Phipps Conservatory, for example, and Botanical Garden. I mean, they're not a museum, but they certainly are a related institution. They're they're now at ne zero net energy use. They generate all their power themselves through photovoltaics and other means, and so. I think it's just a matter of doing a little bit of research there because there's tons of information available. Okay. Uh, I have another one here. How do we reconcile the donor and banks with ties to the fossil, oh yeah, donors and the banks that have ties to the fossil fuel industry that fund our cultural institutions? Well, I, I think you, uh, I mean, that's really a good question. I think you have to start that, uh, you have to start that conversation within your institution. So if you are invested in fossil and fossil fuels, uh, what does that what does that mean for you if you are going to cut those ties? Are there ways you can compensate for that loss of money? And I think one of the most important things to realize is, for example, that the light bulb has gone on in banks with respect to fossil fuels. I was just reading that the Royal Bank of Canada has now refused to provide any money to the oil companies that want to drill in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. They're the first Canadian bank to do it. A whole bunch of other American banks have already done it. So that, that trend has already started in the, um, in the banking industry. Um, and I can't tell you how many hundreds, perhaps thousands of universities and other uh, profit and nonprofit non organizations have now uh, gotten rid of their fossil fuel uh, uh, portfolios. And third, um, I was just reading that there, Canada has a, a mutual fund, an investment fund that has um, explicitly no fossil fuels in its portfolio and it turned a 30% return last year. So I think that question, that question is becoming um, more atrophied now as the world wakes up to the dangers of fossil fuels. And I can only hope that museums will start this conversation and make some decisions for themselves rather than just trying to follow the trend because the trend is changing. And I guess we have time for one last question. It's, um, should we stop building museums? I would say definitely. I, I would say we don't need any more museums. I mean, they're here now. They're a wonderful infrastructure. There are 55, I've heard as many as 80,000 museums in the world. We don't need any more physical plants. And as I pointed out in France, if they are going to implement that uh, limit to 1.5 degrees warming, there will be no new public buildings, including museums. I think what museums now have to do is sort of recalibrate their vision and their mission with a sense of a purpose for the climate crisis and what they can contribute to its mitigation. And that doesn't mean building new buildings. Okay, so thank you uh, for such a powerful presentation. Um, uh, it got, got me thinking about a lot of things. Uh, I think we're all going through our rebuilding, starting our rebuilding plans. And these are this is a lot of great information for us to consider. Um, do you have any final mar remarks, Bob, or is that? No, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I do. I just want to thank you, Kathy, for uh, moderating this. I want to thank Mary for uh, all her work in putting this together. And I want to thank all the people who uh, took the time to listen. Um, I don't know if I should give an email address, but if they wanted to communicate with me, I'd be happy to share whatever I have in terms of literature and resources. I think this conversation has to continue. It's absolutely critical. So... Uh... I, I guess I'm ready to go into the conference closing. Um, and this closes the final session of the OMA annual conference. And thank you to all the delegates and speakers for sharing your time, ideas, and enthusiasm with our community for a full month. <laughs>
and and Robert Jaynes, Museums in Perilous Times, you highlighted the role of museum community in the climate crisis and presented us with compelling uh, propositions to take responsibility for uh, for the future of our planet. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.